Yeah, perfect, perfect. How's your day going so far? Not bad. I haven't, haven't got up too much, but uh, yeah, same. later and that's about it. Yeah, yeah. You back home at Elmira right now? Uh, I'm actually in Air, A-Y-R, so not too far from here in Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not too far. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, it's... Um, it's good to be home, I guess, during this time. I mean, there's a few yeah. positives to drag out of it, but I mean, spending more time with your family. There's a lot of athletes I talk to and they're like, this is the first time I've had a summer off. If they're a baseball player, for example, it's like, yeah. So you got to try to look at the good with the bad, I guess. Yeah. And it's so, so uncertain, especially for those summer sports. They don't really know what they're doing. And exactly. at least for, at least for winter sports, you kind of know they're going to be playing. Yeah. To some December. extent. Yeah. Yeah. I know, man. Anyways, I appreciate you taking some time today. Obviously, we're here to talk a bit about the uh, the mental side of hockey, which I'm stoked about. Um, growing up, you know, Southern Ontario, obviously one of the hotbeds for hockey in, in Canada, in the world probably. How, you know, early was your introduction to the mental part of the game? Was it something that you were aware of as a child? Things like dealing with pressure and maybe pressure from your parents or your fans? Um, or did that come more later on in your career? I'd say it's still pretty early, you know, it's Mm -hmm. kind of growing up playing minor hockey. Obviously you're, you're there with your buddies and your friends and you're just kind of enjoying it. But then it gets to a certain point where you're kind of going into tournaments and playoffs and things and the stakes kind of, kind of get heightened. And uh, probably around like 10, 11, 12 is when you kind of really start to notice that um, obviously hockey's more than just about having fun and you're kind of there to win as well. And, that's kind of when I started noticing the mental aspect of it. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw you you spent some time out in BC playing junior hockey. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I played uh, three years in Elmira, yeah. um, 16 to 20, and then went out and played my final year in BC, kind of realizing that I needed needed to do something to get a, uh, a scholarship to play at school. So kind of made that decision, played my final year out in BC. Uh, it's probably one of the best decisions that I've made. Was it more so were you looking for like a different talent level? Were you looking for more playing time? What was your thought process behind that? Um, probably a different talent level. You know, that's probably one of the the premier junior leagues in Canada, at least, um, that the schools look at. So I kind of had to make the decision. I was getting a few, uh, talking to a few schools when I was playing in Elmira, but no concrete offers. And then uh, made the decision. It was kind of either, do I want to continue playing in Elmira, have some fun, or try and make this into a career and that was kind of what what my thought process was at the time and obviously it was a a tough decision to make that would be the first time I moved away from home but um had to make that decision to to see if I could move on in hockey and make it into a career yeah I think it's um I talk about time and time again but to be a, a a pro athlete, there's a certain amount of sacrifice you have to go through. And one of them, of course, is moving away from home. Walk me through a bit how hard of a decision it actually was. And maybe some people that you leaned on for some words of advice during that time, because it's never easy for a kid to, you know, it's one thing, you know, growing up in Ontario and moving to a different city in Ontario, but it's another thing to go to the other side of Canada, which is no small country by any means. Yeah. And, you know, I always growing up, I played, uh, farthest away from me like my hometown team would probably be like 40 minutes away so just an easy drive for me and my parents to come watch games and stuff so I was always living at home playing in juniors and then uh, that final year I kind of leaned on a couple guys that uh, that had gone over from Ontario to BC and played talked to them a little bit actually on the phone and in person just kind of leading up to that making that decision and uh, getting their thoughts on it and what they liked what they didn't like and uh, kind of went through that. And then I was also, also leaning on my dad a lot. You know, he, he played professional hockey for the, uh, the New York Rangers and then went over to Europe and played. So he was obviously accustomed to, uh, leaving home early. So, uh, just kind of leaned on him for that. And he gave me some good advice and obviously it's a tough decision to make moving away from home, but, uh, using that support system and obviously talking to them a lot, uh, when I was over there, it was so important to, uh, to me being able to play there. Yeah, it obviously paid off for you pretty well getting a, an offer to go to RIT. Walk me through, you know, what was it about RIT that really stuck out to you where you felt like that was the best fit for you going forward? So I was actually uh, just around Christmas time. I, I got traded to a different team in BC because we weren't going to make the playoffs and it was my final year. So it was kind of the, the best for both both parties to uh, for them to get a young guy in return and move on and be able to play playing the playoffs and maybe within a week of me uh of me going over there and playing a few more games for the new team 
Uh, I was actually approached by uh, one of the coaches, a bit about RIT. One guy that played uh, in Elmira went on and played in the AHL for the Marlies, uh, went over to RIT and played. And also Chris Tana of um, yeah. Vancouver guy uh, went over and played at RIT for a year. So I kind of knew a little bit about the school, but, uh, but you know, they showed me pictures. They had a brand new rink, maybe three, four years old. And uh, it's definitely rivaling some of the mini pro rinks. So, uh, it was kind of the best spot for me. Their their academics were great, and uh, their athletic programs are awesome. And the rink was brand new, so uh, I couldn't make a better decision. <laughs> Jumping ahead a bit here, because you mentioned Chris Tanev, I know that a couple of years ago you had an invite out to the Canucks camp out west, and you know they had Chris Tanev for a couple of years. And I read online a lot of people were comparing you to Chris Tanev, like it's just the next Chris Tanev sort of thing. When those things come up, are you even aware of them, or do you try and just kind of block them out as much as possible and try and focus on yourself? I'd say try and block them out. You know, I had, uh, you funny you bring that up. I had one of my buddies send me a, a little clip or something they had on, uh, like a Vancouver Reddit, Reddit page or something about yeah. that, bringing in their prospects to the camp. And, you know, I don't, I don't really try and think about that too much because obviously it's a, a different situation for him. He only stayed one year at school and went right to uh, Vancouver and played in the pros. So uh, I don't try and don't try and compare myself yeah. to those guys <laughs> at all course, because yeah. I know that that's probably not going to be my road. Yeah, but it's got to be a pretty cool feeling. I mean, growing up watching these players on TV and then here you are with other people talking about you might be compared to them in some way. That's got to be a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, it definitely is. You know, obviously I try and tailor some of my game around some top NHLers, you know, like Nick Lindstrom, I, uh, I kind of nice. idolized growing up. So that's kind of the, the way I want to see my game. And, you know, if I could even be a fraction of how good he is, uh, I, th- I think I'd be in a good spot. Of course, he's one of the top, probably top five defensemen of all time. So, exactly. Yeah. Jumping back to your first year at RIT, you obviously killed it there. You had like so many awards. You're Rookie of the Year. You were Academic All Star, Defensive Player of the Week, numerous times. Time as a young kid, and you're starting to get all these awards. What are you thinking? Or is it how hard was it? I guess to kind of stay grounded in those scenarios because I think for some kids, as soon as they get the first, you know, taste of success that's when it goes off the rails for them. Right. But you were able to kind of stay composed and, 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 you know, not get caught up in the, in that hype and in that moment. You know, I think it was important going, my, going into my first year at school. I didn't really know what to expect and how much playing time I was going to get. And we only had uh, we had four freshmen D coming in. So you, we knew that uh, you kind of had to step up in those situations. And if, if you were showing well, you're going to play probably the whole year. And obviously I did have a good year and uh, had some, so I had some interest from NHL teams to come to camps. And I think it was so important to stay grounded because that was my, my first year. I knew that I still had probably at least three more years of development after that. But I kind of just, just realized that I needed to soak that all in. But um, that wasn't the end game. You know, obviously yeah. getting awards are, are great. But uh, at that point, they mean really nothing in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And I think one of the more underappreciated awards you got was the academic all-star because t- being able to be really good on the ice and really good off the ice, like with the books and, and, and in course and everything, I think is no easy task. Walk us through a bit, just that transition of, you know, you're just, you're, you're coming from a time where you're just, you know, in high school, just kind of playing junior hockey to now you're in university, right? You're balancing crazy coursework and course load and crazy hockey trainings are able to balance it all and excel in both. Yeah, I was always a, a good student growing up, but then uh, obviously going to university and uh, and realizing that you only had uh, two games on a weekend, but uh, those games, if they were away, they were probably six, seven hour drives sometimes to uh, do different spots in New York, Boston, um, Pennsylvania, that kind of thing. So obviously a lot needs to get done on the bus and yeah. Yeah, you kind of learn how you have to manage your time well. And uh, obviously some guys do that better than others. And uh, there's guys that are more accustomed to doing that through juniors and uh, and school as well. But uh, that was a big thing for me, learning how to manage my time and, uh, and just put put enough time into my schoolwork and also um, thinking about my, my personal and mental aspects of obviously playing well and doing well in school. Yeah. And you mentioned managing time. That's one of the core like life lessons you get from playing college sports. You know, things like problem solving, working as a team. I always tell people that college sports, whether or not you have aspirations to go pro or not, is one of the most like beneficial things a person can do because you learn so many life lessons throughout that process. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that was obviously one of the reasons that I wanted to, uh, to continue on at school and play is because, you know, you never know what's going to happen after you're done playing, but those are some of the best memories and some of the best life lessons you can take. And coming out of there with two degrees, uh, it probably wasn't, yeah. wasn't the, uh, 
Oh, probably one of the best decisions I ever made going there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I see behind you, you got the C up on your jersey uh, <laughs> at your time there. When did that come about? Was that your, I can't remember if it was your second or third year or was it after that? It was that? My, uh, my final year. The so final year, we, okay. Yeah, uh, I got a couple of jerseys at my office upstairs. I put them up when I came home from school. So yeah. uh, obviously some good memories and uh, a little bit of a, a nice throwback that I can always look on. Uh, sure. Some good memories there at IIT. Was that something that you expected to happen? Like, did you have any kind of intuition that you're going to be named captain? Or was it a total surprise to you? Um, I didn't, I wouldn't say I expected it to happen, but I thought I had a good chance at uh, either being a captain or an assistant in my final year. And, you know, I thought the guys obviously leaned on me from, even from when I was a freshman and a sophomore, you know, I had a, a big, a big role in the team and I thought I, I led well both on and off the ice. So I thought, uh, I thought I was a good candidate for being named a captain or assistant. Did you, did you, you know, how hard was it, I guess, to keep your game the same being a captain? I think for some people, they get that C and they try to maybe be somebody that they're not, right? But you, the reason why you got the C was for the player you are. And obviously you continue to be um, the player you were after that. But just walk me through, I guess, a bit about the first couple of weeks of being a captain and if you had to change your game at all, your leadership style, or everything was kind of just, you know, run the mill. I know, like you said, I think there are guys that uh, definitely try and do too much when yeah. they're uh, when they're named a captain or something like that for any sports team. And I think my leadership style was kind of lead by example, less by less by vocal and less by being vocal and talking. Um, so obviously, guys that guys that knew me from the team knew that I was going to do everything right on and off the ice. You know, preparation for games, uh, mentally, physically, eating well, that kind of thing. So. Uh, I just try to do that as much as possible, not try and change uh, much to be a, be a person that I wasn't, wasn't going to be. So obviously trying to lead by example more than being, uh, being a vocal leader. And, you know, when guys would know that when I would say things, they had, uh, they had meaning behind them. So trying, to, uh, trying not to add too much fluff that way. Yeah, yeah. Is there one game or, or, or a run of games or even a tournament at your time at RIT where, where you look back on and you really think the mental game of hockey and how strong your mental game has really helped you? Maybe this past year we had the, uh, the 2010 team come in that went to the, uh, the Frozen Four. Yeah. So it was a weekend. I think we were playing Canisius. Um, and we were down maybe 4-1 going into the third period. And those, uh, that 2010 team came in, maybe 10, 15 guys came down to the dressing room in between the, uh, the second and third and wow. uh, just, just told us, you know, what, what a special, special thing it was for them to come back this year and uh, come watch us play. And obviously, I think that sparked something in us. And, and we kind of took it upon ourselves. So, you know, we weren't going to get embarrassed when this team was here. You know, they, they were one of the foundational teams that uh, brought the new arena to RIT. So we kind of took it upon ourselves. And I, I think we... Uh, we kind of knew as a leadership group that we had to do something, spark something in this and these guys between the second and third. And we actually came out and uh, settled the deficit one, five, four with uh, maybe a minute left in the game. And I think that was kind of one of the, the turning points for us. And obviously we didn't get to finish the season this year, but that was kind of one of the turning points that we always look back to that comeback in that game from our, our leadership group was, uh, was something special. And we knew that we had a, a championship team at that point being able to turn that, turn that game around in a, in a snap and come back. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful story. And it really goes to show that I think hockey is one of the, of all the sports I watch, it's one of the sports that really sticks out to me where comebacks are so prevalent and you're really never out of a game in hockey, right? It's such a fast paced game and goals can come by the dozens that you never can really give up as a hockey team. Cause you know, there's countless examples of in the NHL, how many teams are down four or five goals in the third period and they come back, right? You need that, that winning mentality to never give up. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between, you know, a championship team and a team that might be good and good and talented, but doesn't have the, the character to go all the way and win a, win a championship. And I think that's something that a team can definitely look back on throughout the year and kind of see those hardships. And obviously there's going to be times in the playoffs where, where teams aren't doing as well or don't think they can make it, but you kind of have to look back at those times throughout the year where you did, uh, did surpass those hardships and overcome those times. And uh, I think those are the times you have to look back on and really uh, used to move forward. Yeah. And when, when this whole coronavirus thing broke out your last year, was your season wrapped up already or were you guys still in the midst of, of the playoffs? So we were, uh, the first round of playoffs had been played. Uh, we were waiting for those teams to come. We were actually playing air force from Colorado. So they flew in on a Wednesday, um, 
we're going to practice on Thursday morning. We were about, we were going to practice at 11 o'clock. You know, our, our coach came in maybe 1045 right before we were going on the ice said, uh, as of right now, the games are still on, but they're going to be played with no fans. So that was kind of a, a weird thing to, uh, to grasp. So, you know, you never really played in front of no fans at any time. And obviously the playoffs, we were going to get a good crowd, probably three, 4,000. Uh, and then we go out there on the ice and then maybe just kind of shooting around at the start of practice, 11, 15 rolls around and, uh, our equipment manager comes over and says, you know, they, they shut down the whole Atlantic hockey. And then maybe an hour later, we get the news that the whole NCAA sports is shut down. So wow. it kind of happened really quick and yeah. didn't really know how to process it and realize that, uh, you know, I'd played my last collegiate game at that point and uh, I didn't even know that that was going to happen. That's t- Yeah, it was tough because, you know, we mentioned – a little bit before the interview is like, you know, for the summer collegiate athletes, it's tough for them because they don't know if they're going to have a sport or not. But I also re- felt really bad for players in your situation where you're in your last year, right? And, and you know, there's senior night, there's your last conference tourney run, all that kind of stuff. And for a lot of athletes, that was taken away from them. So for you yourself, how did you get over that, that adversity, I guess, or, or that mental feeling that you're missing out on what is your last dance? Kind of not to, to quote Michael Jordan here, but your last <laughs> dance at RIT. It was, uh, it was definitely really sad. I didn't know how to take it at first because, uh, he came out and told us like, that was it, that yeah, like there's our season, like there's no more games or we can't even fight for a championship. And obviously for the seniors, it's tough because we had our senior night a couple of weeks ago and I had some of my buddies down and I was just ta- telling them like, Oh, I'd love to have you guys back for the playoffs. Like if we can make it to Buffalo and make it to the Harbor center, like that's a quick drive, maybe a couple hours. And, they were, they were so excited, but, uh, obviously we didn't get that chance. And, you know, we're, we're still sitting out on the ice wondering what to do. Like, do we get off the ice? Do we just have a last scrimmage as a team? And that's what we eventually decided to do. But at that point, it's kind of like, you know, obviously disappointing that you didn't get a chance to fight for a championship, but at the same time, like there was nothing we could do. And it's definitely bigger than bigger than sport at that point and maybe we didn't realize that at the time but uh there there was obviously nothing we could do and kind of just enjoy that time with the team uh because we didn't know how long that was going to last before we'd be sent home yeah and for me personally because i was in the midst of training for some tennis tournaments and one thing that helped me get over the whole stoppage of play and everything was um that it's not just me going through this. It's different. Like we're an injury. If I get injured, I'm on the sideline. Everyone else is competing. That's really hard for me to swallow. But if it's the case where everyone's in it together, it's a little easier for me to swallow that pill. And like you said, it's, it's bigger than sports in this scenario, right? It's the health and safety of everybody first. And it sucks, but, but you can see the clear reason behind everything stopping. Yeah. And, you know, I had a conversation with one, one of the other seniors that was obviously looking to go on and at, after the end of the season, you're able to sign and play professionally somewhere. And uh, that was kind of one of the hard things to grasp is, you know, we were done, but maybe, maybe these other leagues, the AHL, NHL, were still going to move on and, and keep playing. But obviously they were shut down for a, a certain portion of time. And eventually the AHL just canceled their whole season. Yeah. Uh, and obviously you, when you're kind of put out of playoffs, it's it's almost like a tiered system where guys that are put out can then sign. But uh, all of a sudden, everyone in the NCAA is done, and they're all yeah. looking for professional contracts. So you're kind of put in a different position where now there's a whole different pool of guys that are looking for, to play professionally and sign with a with an AHL or NHL team, and that kind of puts more pressure on you to decide what you're going to do or if you're going to have those opportunities. Yeah, it worked out for you. Those I used time with the Islanders organization not too long yeah. ago. Walk me through that process, man, and, and maybe some of the emotions that you have after signing that contract. You know, at the end of the season, obviously, everything ended so soon. We didn't really know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen. Kind of uh, talked to my advisor right after to see what uh, what was going on with the professional leagues, and he he didn't have too much information for me. And a couple of weeks passed at that point, kind of seeing what was going to happen with the professional leagues that they were shut down at that point. Uh, and obviously a little bit discouraging because that's one of the things you look forward to after you're done your senior season is going on signing and playing professionally for the rest of the year. Uh, and obviously that, that wasn't an option for me at that point. So definitely, definitely a little bit down and uh, not being able to sign somewhere and didn't know what was going to happen throughout the rest of the summer. And it was nice to get a deal done really early with the, uh, the Islanders there and Bridgeport because now I know where I'm going to end up yeah. at the end of the summer. That's nobody ever likes kind of being left in the dark and being unexpected. And with all of this, you know, I think athletes in general, they like to be in control, right? They like to be in control of the outcome of the game. They like to be in control of their play, but this is a situation where as an athlete, 
pretty much have no control of what's going on around you and you kind of got to sit back and let the, the dominoes fall. Yeah. And that was, that was a tough thing to kind of grasp too, because there's nothing I could do. Like they'd obviously seen me uh, multiple times throughout the year and through the past years playing. Um, but obviously they were going to probably come down and see me in playoffs as well. So, you know, there's nothing you could do at that point. They've seen, they always try to see enough of you and hopefully uh, the way you showed uh, is enough for them to, uh, to offer you a contract at that point. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I want to break down quickly here, obviously you're a pretty offensive defenseman. They're a bit of a power play specialist and I want to break down your slap shot a bit. I think it's so interesting kind of the balance between overthinking and underthinking when playing sports, specifically when taking a shot, for example, for me in tennis at the beginning, I used to really overthink my shot and what really helped me was kind of just let my body take over and not think about what I'm about to do and, and let those hours and hours of practice kind of just, take over i'm not even really thinking about what i'm doing on the court i'm just laying the racket swing is that kind of the same mentality you have a bit when you're taking a slap shot is are you just letting your body kind of you know take the lead and your mind kind of take a back seat in that scenario yeah i think so i think definitely when you're younger you're kind of thinking about yeah. things too much and kind of your mechanics of shooting but at this point it's kind of second nature almost to especially slap shots and one timers it's kind of you've taken so many of them. You, you don't <laughs> obviously know what's going to happen. And hopefully you're just kind of, there's so much room for error that uh, you kind of get it on the wrong spot of the stick or the, in the wrong spot of your feet. That's probably not going to go where you want. Right. So you're just hoping that all those things line up uh, at one time for a good shot. Yeah. Yeah. A little, uh, little game I like to play here on this podcast is I have a collection of sports psychology quotes. I got 12 of them here for us. I'll let you pick a number between one and 12. We'll do it a couple of times and I'll read you the quote. And I want you to just reflect on the quote a bit and maybe think back about a time throughout your career so far where it really rings true. All right. Let's go with, uh, we'll go with my, my number, number two. Number two, eh? This is a popular quote. Everyone likes to pick the number two, but this is from uh, Lou Holtz. He's a former Notre Dame football head coach. He said, uh, if what you did yesterday seems big, you haven't done anything today. I like that one. Because, you know, you obviously don't want to rest on your laurels of uh, what you've done in the past. And uh, just like we talked about with the, uh, the awards and recognition, yeah. it's, nice to, it's nice to get those accolades, but uh, it means nothing if you're not moving forward and, and doing something bigger in the future. Yeah. I always like to use the, like the analogy of like climbing a mountain. Like you think of yourself as an athlete climbing a mountain, you're climbing up and up. As soon as you get to the top and the top could be in this example, getting all those awards your first year, right? As soon as you take a st your foot off the pedal, there's guys kind of the mountain just as hard as you were. And you know, one day you taking a day off, they're making that much gain on you. So I, I, I really think that's a good lesson for athletes is yeah. If what you did seems big yesterday, then you haven't done anything today because you got to keep going forward. Yeah, I agree. It's almost like that falls flat of the mountain. You know, you get there, you think you're you're kind of at the top at that point, but there's so much more and so much more potential you have to uh, to go. Yeah, yeah. You got another number in mind between one and twelve? Uh, let's go uh, number six, my old junior number. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, another good one, a little similar, but it's still pretty good. This is from Jerry West, legendary uh, Lakers guard. He said, "If you can't get much done, you said you can't get much done in life if you only work on the days when you feel good." I like that one too, because it's, <laughs> you know, it's important, especially now. And, uh, with the, the pandemic kind of looming, it's, it's obviously guys are, guys are going to be, uh, going to be vying for spots and there's going to be guys that are taking days off and uh, maybe don't want to train, don't want to, don't want to work out at home, maybe have no equipment or something, but it's, it's these important times where you obviously have to keep doing, doing your training. And, uh, if you want to move forward, because there's going to be guys that are pushing for spots, pushing for your spot, maybe. And if you're not doing it, they're going to be doing it. So yeah. I think that's so important right now. Yeah. Like you mentioned this time is that's such a relevant quote for this time, because I think a lot of people, they may, you know, half-ass their workouts during this time, just because they're at home or they might not take things so seriously, but it's, it's the athletes that are still trying to keep up their, their regular schedule and working as hard as they can that have come out on the other side of this pandemic better than probably they were going into it. Yeah. Especially from a mental yeah. perspective, there's a lot of mental things you can work on with this time off as well. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do one more quote here. You got another number between one and 12. Uh, let's go 10. 10. This is a, uh, this is a really, really good one. I haven't said this one before, but this is from uh Steffi Graf. She's an old, um, uh, old German tennis player. She said, sometimes I wish I could have been more relaxed, but then I wouldn't have been the same player. I, 
I don't know what to think about that one because <laughs> obviously you're in, in sport, you're trying to stay as relaxed as possible. You don't want to get too, too uptight and just, you don't want to think too much. I'd say, especially in hockey, maybe it's different in other sports, but you don't want to think too much because then your, your mind kind of takes over and you're, you're overthinking things. You just want to play the game. And that's something that one of our coaches would talk about all the time. Maybe we're, we weren't playing as well off the start of the game and maybe there were some mistakes and uh, that was so important to just kind of go back to your training and go back to what, what made you, what made you good in the first place, what put you on the team in the first place to, uh, to just play well and kind of shut those mental aspects out. And obviously for me, I want to stay relaxed out there and yeah. uh, kind of let, let your body do what it's, what it's known to do, what you've trained to do. And uh, I don't know if I'd fully agree with that quote, but I think I'd kind of tweak it to, uh, to how I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like, I like your take on it a lot. I think what you really highlighted is different things work for different players just because there's one yeah. way to do something doesn't mean that's going to work for every athlete in the world. And for somebody like you being super calm and relaxed before a game helps you. Whereas for somebody else, like them getting hyped up in the moment and, you know, blasting their EDM in the dressing room, whatever, that's what helps them. Right. And yeah, but like you said, you don't want to be, so not relaxed where you're nervous and tense during the game you really would do want to be relaxed and let your body take over let's uh before we wrap up here i got a couple rapid fire questions for you because we're in quarantine right now so i gotta know what what are you binge watching <laughs> these days i was watching uh tiger king for a little bit yeah good one good one and then i moved on to the uh the last dance i was really a fan yeah. of that i thought it was great that was really the, uh, good yeah just kind of I heard they had over 10,000 hours of footage and yeah. obviously they tried to try to put it down into 10, 10 hours of a, a TV show. And I thought it was great. Just kind of yeah. learning how Jordan did, uh, it just became the player that he was and just how controlled he was and, and how, uh, how controlling he was on the court. Obviously you see guys that are, uh, his teammates and people outside the organization say like, Oh, kind of what an asshole he was, or yeah. uh, they don't really get, that side of sports, but obviously you're, you're going to want to be on a team with, with a guy that's going to show up every night and give you his all. And uh, I thought it was great just to see kind of behind the scenes of that, uh, that team and that run they made. And it, you know, it presents as a basketball documentary, a Michael Jordan documentary, but it's really a sports documentary and yeah. probably even like a life lesson documentary as well. Cause so many things in sports, like we touched on a bit, apply to your personal life as well. And a lot of the lessons that, that I gained from Michael Jordan, not only apply to, you know, me in sports, but me in life in general. Yeah, I agree. Another quarantine question for you. Uh, what's your snack of choice since everything's been shut down? What are you snacking on when you're snack not supposed to choice. be? Probably trail mix. Yeah. Uh, I like to make my own trail mix at all and different almonds and uh, peanuts, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. that's probably one of my go-tos right now. I like, I like those too. Those can get pretty dangerous and addicting for yeah. me. So I got to <laughs> calm myself down a bit. Yeah. You uh, obviously grew up, we were in about the same age. You grew up, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. I like to think of the golden era of NHL jerseys. What are some NHL jerseys that stick out to you during that time? Probably one of my one of my favorite teams growing up was the da Dallas Stars. So okay. probably their old school, uh, the Bull logo. Uh, you look back and one of my favorite players at the time was Marty Turco. So yeah. that's probably one of my favorite jerseys. I think I have an old one somewhere in the house. And I uh, obviously love those jerseys. And then... Uh, those are probably my favorite of the, of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up a Leafs fan, but the stars Jersey has a special place. Cause that was the first ever like house league team I played on. We were had that <laughs> stars, the white Jersey with yeah. like, the, the star yeah. symbol, like you said. And, and I grew up, I don't know why, but I loved watching Darian Hatcher playing when he was on the stars. Yeah. I always <laughs> used to play within the NHL games. For me, one Jersey that sticks out that I don't see a lot of people think about too often, but I really like the old uh, Washington Capitals jerseys, like the black ones with the yeah. Eagle going across. I think those yeah. are pretty sick. I still remember the, uh, I think it was one of the early Ovi's early years where he had that uh, goalie comes across the middle sliding on his back and he kind of, yeah, I guess the yeah, I, I think, think they were wearing those, uh, those old sweaters at that point. Yeah. yeah. Those are nasty. Yeah. What are, um, for some people that aren't too familiar with, with the Atlantic conference or you play for, for college, what are some of the toughest buildings to play in some of the best environments where you went in and the away fans were giving you, giving you a rough time? Probably one of the toughest for fans would be Air Force. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of cool. You see all the uh, the Air Force cadets in their uniforms up in the stands, yeah. and they have a, a pretty rowdy student section. Uh, obviously, that's one of the toughest, and they'll they'll definitely get on you there. And then obviously, some of the other places where 
or maybe it's like a Tuesday, the odd Tuesday night game where we're only an hour or something away. Those are all obviously tough to get up for because maybe there's not as many people in the stands and uh, you're, you're kind of having school on your mind. You know, you got a big week of school coming up, maybe exams or something. So those are also probably some tough games to get up for. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you mentioned Air Force because that wouldn't be the first school that I think of as like a hockey school per se. Yeah. Right? But like you said, it's a different environment when you see all the cadets and their uniforms in the stands. It gives it a bit of a different feeling. Yeah, and an army too. You know, they yeah. obviously have battles going against each other in hockey and football, and uh, that was probably one of the toughest ranks to play in. I, I remember their boards were just uh, rock hard. They had like lined concrete right along behind them, so uh, you'd obviously try and stay away from the boards as much as possible, or or you could have a bad mishap with your shoulder. <laughs> Last one here. Who do you think would be a good guest in the podcast? Who's one one of your former teammates or what a buddy? One of your buddies that you really think that's a strong mental game that you look up at that you look up to a strong mental game this guy i played with him for three years he's also uh, at bridgeport now eric brown he's uh he's definitely an interesting guy yeah he, uh, he loves to talk about the mental side of things and and he'll get off on tangents almost like Ilya Brzezgal <laughs> talking about the universe too. So I think he'd be a, he'd be yeah, a really yeah. interesting guest to have on. If, if, you, if you got a plug for him, I appreciate that, that. He sounds like a fun guy to talk to. <laughs> yeah, he'd be a great guy to have on. Awesome, awesome. Anyways, Adam, appreciate you taking some time today. Um, like I say with everybody, I hope that you, you know your friends and your family and everybody is staying safe and healthy during this time. And I know the NHL is, is ramping up plans to to head back on the ice soon, but I hope everything kind of gets cleared up for when you're ready to go play with Bridgeport and we can see you on the ice again pretty soon. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate you having me on today. Awesome, man. Take care. You too.